There is a full-blown battle that's going on between the judiciary and the government on the appointment of judges. The judiciary says the existing system, the collegium system, which is a grouping of the senior most judges of the Supreme Court, that is good enough to continue to appoint High Court and Supreme Court judges. But the government says when the judiciary is getting its fingers in, in all other forms of government or branches of government from decisions of the executive to bills being passed in parliament, then why should the executive and the legislature not have a say in the judges that are being appointed to the highest courts of this land? The NJAC was brought in 2015. It was passed by parliament by a large majority, but it was struck down by the Supreme Court saying it is unconstitutional. The question that begs to be asked is, should the judges also relent and accept that there has to be some amount of either executive or parliamentary oversight over who is being appointed as a judge? After all, in the US, in the UK, the executive and the legislature play a role in the appointment of judges. Why should judges behave like the appointment in senior positions, both in high courts as well as in the Supreme Court, is some kind of a turf war. But first, the story so far. in a much needed historic step passed in 99th constitutional amendment bill paving way for the national judicial commission there was unprecedented support the lok sabha unanimously voted in its favor which is unfortunately building up does not work well for the constitutional scheme and therefore uh, I had given a notice under rule 184 uh, an adjournment notice uh, to have a detailed discussion the Congress party and we are the Congress party all right, this is a full-blown confrontation between the judiciary and the executive. The question is, who will mind the judges? Of course, the judges mind everything, because after all, every law that is passed by parliament has to stand the test of law has to stand the test of judicial scrutiny, but what about the appointment of judges? Joining us now on the talking point this evening, Justice B.A. Khan is former Chief Justice of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court. Arima Sundram will be joining us, Senior Advocate in the Supreme Court. Sanya Talwar is Editor of Law Beat. Adil Singh Boparai is an advocate and spokesperson of the Congress Party. Let me start with you, Justice B.A. Khan. You know, in principle, no one has a problem with the existing system, the collegium system. It has worked well. It has worked well for a number of years. I think the, the issue is, what the government is asking is, if in every other domain of appointments, from appointments in the government, appointments in the legislature, appointments, of course, even in the election commission, which the judges had a few things to say about a few weeks ago, uh, if the judges can weigh in on all of that, why shouldn't government, a popularly elected government, which is the basic principle of democracy, why shouldn't they have a say in judges who are appointed to senior positions either in high courts or in the Supreme Court? Zaka, but who says is that government doesn't have a hand? They are the movers and shakers. And they start uh, sharing it from the day ago. Uh, the very uh, uh, stage when the appointment process just starts, government shares it somehow or the other that one knows uh, who goes through that experience. But when you look at it superficially at the highest level, uh, how, how does one think that government doesn't have a hand? Don't you see that the government sits on the proposals for six months, seven months, and that is the cause for delay of appointments? 
Don't you see that the collision recommendations, uh, even if reiterated, uh, are returned? Now, who, this is not, you see, for example, let me tell you the actual process. Actual process is for high court judge, when a, a, a process is initiated, that process goes through government at two levels. It goes to the chief minister, it goes to the governor, then it reaches the central law ministry, and then after, after that it goes to of the course. Supreme Court. Yeah. Now at every stage, you have uh, either interventions or suggestions, or you may call it whatever, maybe by the chief minister or maybe by the governor. And unless it is approved politically, much of it doesn't go through. So to say that the government has no share in appointments is only looking at it superficially. No, but just my, my, my point was you also agree that these six months delay, seven months delay, maybe sometimes even a year's delay is perhaps caused by the fact that the government, uh, it does not, you know, have a say or not, not, not have a say, but the government's choice is not endorsed. Uh, by the by the judges, by the collegium, so as it were. Not, that, that is not true. Practically on ground, uh, consultation, they share who the candidates are and, and who should get cleared and who should not get cleared. So those are the back channel talks, as you call them. So it's not that. It is happening everywhere, but this is the only problem today is that um, what I see is that there is a pattern to take away this collegial uh, system from the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and uh, appropriate it to the executive. Okay, to, to, to come up with an NJAC-like uh, system. But let, let me ask Arima Sundaram, who's joining us. Today, what the court said was pretty scathing in its, uh, in its observations, uh, where uh, a bench headed by Justice uh, Sanjay Kishan Kaul basically said that Parliament has the power to enact laws. The government can ask the Parliament to lay down a new law. No one can prohibit it. You want to bring in a new law, gather consensus, you can always do that. However, you may have to then stand the scrutiny of a challenge. The scheme of the Constitution requires the court to be the final arbiter on the position of a law as enacted by Parliament. Now, yes, of course, no one is taking away the rights of the Supreme Court to see if a law that's passed is constitutional or not, or stands the test of judicial scrutiny. But if you have a popularly elected government, and in a democracy, whether you like it or not, that is a reflection of the will of the people. And if the will of the people has passed a law, then should the judiciary have the final say on it, as Justice Call may be uh, indicating in the statement that he made? Well, to say anything contrary to what uh, Justice Call said would be to rewrite the entire Constitution of India and the very concept of uh, modern democracy. Let's understand what is modern democracy. Modern democracy has as its very basic, basic fulcrum what is known as the separation of powers. By the separation of powers, you have the executive and the judiciary, and in a case where the legislature is a totally separate body, the legislature. And each has its scope of activity. Now, under our constitution and under the constitution of most countries, including the United States of America, which everyone likes to tout about, the American Supreme Court also. Well, the fact is that the final arbiter as to whether a law is constitutionally valid or not is the courts. So what Justice Cole said today is nothing really different than what the law as we know it is, and not only the law as we know it. Starting from 1215 AD in the Magna Carta, the concept of the rule of law. Now, it doesn't mean that just because there is a majority and the majority decides at that given time to do something which is against the constitution, that the court cannot interfere with it at all. That is not so at all, nor is it the basis of our constitution. Our constitution makes the Supreme Court the final arbiter and in fact goes no, no, one that, step that's further. That's in the process of lawmaking and, 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 and adjudicating upon that law. It if I, if that I may, law, Mr. Sundaram, on the question of appointment of judges, if the U.S. Supreme Court, the judges are appointed by the executive, the same thing is followed in the U.K. and other major democracies around the world. Why should a popularly elected executive, a popularly elected government not have a say in the appointment of judges in high courts and in the Supreme Court of this country? Well, the reason is very simple. When the case of Gupta came up, 
and this whole guidelines was laid down and the law interpreted and the collegium system introduced, there was a feeling that the executive at that time was interfering in the course of justice by cherry picking, hand picking judges as per their choice. And perhaps if people were not felt to be more, uh, you know, uh, uh, let me say more academically or more uh, through policy or belief against what the policy or the belief of the government was. The government of that day, and we're going back to 1994, okay. the government of that day felt that, uh, look, we don't want such a person as a judge. Now, that immediately strikes at the very independence of judiciary. The independence of the judiciary is that a judge is fearless, a judge decides the way he wants, the judge decides a the case according to the absolutely, Constitution. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is the independence of the judiciary. I, I, I don't disagree so with you So in which there. case, if it was felt at that time that the executive was interfering with this course of justice but, by trying to pack a court, and but, that was the expression I remember being used in those days, packing a court, superseding judges, superseding the chief justices, you know, it was, it was a situation where it had really got out of hand. F fair and enough. No, no, I don't disagree with you on while that. While it Mr. does Surab, say I don't the disagree president with you on will that. appoint, it doesn't say on whose advice. Le let me ask Sanya Talwar though, by that same token, by that same token that if you were to give the executive a more than fair share of its say in appointment of judges, then it will lead to, as he said, the packing of pliant judges in high courts and supreme courts. No one, no one is disagreeing with that. But by that same token, Sanya Talwar, Shouldn't the, uh, the minutes of the collegium meeting, what was decided as far as the credentials of Judge X or Judge Y, shouldn't that be made public? Uh, because if every decision of the government, a popularly elected government, is uh, held up either in court, uh, has to stand the test of judicial scrutiny, or more importantly, also open now to the Right to Information Act, why shouldn't the minutes of the collegium as to why... Uh, the, the, the collegium of judges opposed this, the candidature of a certain judge or why they uh, approved the can candidature of a certain judge, should that not be made public for the country to know? Precisely, Zaka. I think uh, the, the question that we should be asking today is judicial sovereignty or primacy versus judicial independence. These are two things that we should be focusing on as against each other instead of the executive versus judiciary. Uh, like you rightly pointed out, nowhere in the world are uh, judges pointed out primarily by the and only by the judici judicial members or the judges itself. Uh, the entire concept of appointments is just shrouded in mystery and it's uh, uh, for all the amazing work that the judiciary has done in the country. Uh, I think it is very important that uh, the system and the way the transparency uh, that, that is expected of a constitutional democracy is also projected in the judiciary. Um, if we are looking at the system as it stands today, no doubt the collegium is something that has already been upheld by the Supreme Court and that is a system that is nowhere mentioned in the constitution uh, for that matter. Uh, but yeah, of course, uh, it, nobody is taking away the power of the Supreme Court, like you said, uh, to be the far, final arbiter of law. Uh, the, uh, the senior designations are uh, always uh, projected. There is a proper streamlined system for it. Uh, it the, 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 the concept is made public um, of how, who is chosen. Uh, why are, in the UPSC for that matter, let's take that example. There is a certain criteria yeah. which is followed. It is made public. Why not the system of appointment of judges then? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, Adil Singh Boparai, whether it is the appointment of the CBI uh, uh, director, whether it's the appointment of secretaries to various ministries or the cabinet secretary, all of this is made public or it's available publicly if uh, uh, a citizen of India chooses to ask through an RTI. And of course, all of these appointments, if there is any aggrieved party, he or she is well within their right to move either the uh, uh, ACC or they can even move a court of law. Why shouldn't that same principle apply to the appointment of judges? Well, Zaka, at the outset, the Congress Party is deeply dismayed by the ruling dispensation's consistent attempts to browbeat the judiciary. We're deeply dismayed. The judiciary in our country is the bulwark of our constitution. In a system of checks and balances, it is the judiciary which checks the tyranny of any majoritarian government. You may be in a majority, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're right. No, Number Adil, three, Adil, if I may, Adil... 
The problem is, uh, as Justice Khan was saying before you joined the show, the problem is the government then sits on these names for six months, eight months, sometimes up to a year, because they don't want to clear these names. Now, would you rather, you know, uh, avoid? Look at look at the Supreme Court itself right now. In, in what should be a full strength of, I think, thirty four, thirty five, there's a vacancy of six or seven. I mean, so what's what, that? Story? No, let's 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 test this. Let's test this, Zaka. I'm glad you raised this point because it's a very important issue. Let's test this. For example, tomorrow X name is sent by the Supreme Court Collegium to the government. The government, based on IB reports and otherwise, makes certain notings which are plausible. Hmm. Where those notings are done based on certain material, okay. and those notings are then the file is returned back to the Collegium. If there is basis to those notings, why would the Collegium not reconsider that name? It merely can't be that the government says that it is my way or the highway. If the name is agreeable to me, then I will issue warrants. Otherwise, I will not issue warrants. Yes, this is a problem. The government sitting on files is a problem because that is a manifestation that either you send our names or we will sit over those names, no matter the vacancies may rise. So, therefore, it is important the government has its say. So, the point which I'm trying to emphasize is that the government has its say. It can make notings. It can return the file to the Supreme Court Collegium. It is on the second round that they're bound to. Uh, pay heed and issue warrants. The, so the, therefore, let's not lose sight of the fact that we're a government, we're a constitutional framework which is based on the edifice of checks and balances. No one organ can ride roughshod over the other. So, so I, want, I, want to ask, over, I want to ask then to Justice Khan that at the end of the day, then what value does a popular mandate, not forget about popular mandate, there are laws that have been passed unanimously by parliament, unanimously across party lines that have been held up in the Supreme Court, then, then what value does uh, unanimity in a democracy have, political consensus in a democracy have? Uh, Zaka, I think a uh, distinction first is to be made on two or three things. One is selection process, another is appointment. Selection process, we have to have a selection body for any appointment, for example, as you have in the bureaucracy or as you have in the police, similarly in judiciary. Question is, for ensuring independence of judiciary, there has to be some selection mechanism which is independent of the government so that you don't have an executive interference tomorrow or on day-to-day -day basis. Now, why it was given to the Collegium at that time was in the hope that the Collegium comprising of five senior judges know better who are the suitable people from the bar, who have the merit, who can be good judges and so on and so forth. Second, that they will act fairly, they will act in transparency and they will have some criteria to choose. That didn't happen. The result is any system is good or bad as you work it out. Now, those expectations failed and we had yeah. complaints and we had genuine complaints. Now, those complaints were nepotism also, favoritism also, pick and choose also, all as it is happening elsewhere. This is one. Second, there is a misconception that oh, we have a, a people's uh, representation and uh, Supreme Court is uh, nullifying a people's yeah. will. Who gets to interpret the law? Should that be left to the interpreters of the law or should that be left to people who will be elected only, by popular only, way? Inter only interpreters of law. Zakat, do you know that in our parliament, what is the percentage of the MPs who participate in the legislation? Do you know how many of them know what law is made? made? How can you trust um, a system like that? Okay. But no. that's not the point. So point is parliament has a domain to make law. It falls within its prerogative. No, uh, so the Supreme Court has the jurisdiction to strike down it. I, I want to ask to uh, specifically on the context in the context of appointment of judges, Arima Sundaram, the fundamental in the con, in difference. The, in, the, in, the con, in the context of appointment of judges, distinction is lost between a selection process and appointment. Okay. Appointment is appointment is done by the government, but fair, selection fair process, enough. for example, if, for example, you know if a public service commission, UPSC. You know, the, there's a history to why the collegium system came into place, whether it was the second judge's verdict or the third judge's verdict. Uh, ultimately, there were instances where government was superseding chief justices of five courts and even sometimes uh, the chief justice of the Supreme Court. Ultimately, the whole idea of having a judiciary as a third pillar was to keep a check 
on the executive was to keep a check on political power. Therefore, these judgments came into play and that's why the collegium system uh, came into existence. So, uh, the chances of the executive misusing its power uh, is far more than it is of, uh, uh, of judges because at the end of the day, they have fixed in yours. See, Zaka, I come from the thought process that uh, we, when we're looking at any particular provision, it's also ideal that we look at what the constitution makers originally also envisaged. Uh, when we're looking at uh, the appointments of judges and when we're looking at, uh, say, other appointments, uh, say, the senior designations, etc., why is it that when we are designating a senior, we are looking at a full court reference and we are asking the entire court for their designation. But when we are looking at uh, judicial appointments, we are only looking at three judges. We are only you know, uh, deciding among three judges for the high courts. Uh, so this, this transparency, this has to come out. I mean, it has to come uh, on the face of it because uh, that is what okay. the constitution makers also envisaged. Uh, but to say that uh, if one particular uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, you know, constitutional democracy has more veto than the other, it will make a better system. I don't think uh, that is what the constitution makers also envisaged. They wanted a middle ground. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, I, I agree with, in principle at least, with one of the things that Sanya said, that ultimately you need a better system. Uh, I think everyone can agree that the current system may not be exactly 100% uh, right. And therefore, if there is a mechanism to have that better system, and Arima Sundaram is right, if the veto power was with the CJI and not with the executive in the appointment of judges, maybe the NGAC would have stood judicial scrutiny. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much uh, for joining us.